Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you to our first of three panels where we, in partnership with Northwell Health, are recognizing some of the top leaders across the sports industry. We're kicking off our series by speaking with two sports performance experts. We have the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Amy West and Dr. Jen Welter. Now, Dr. Amy West is a sports medicine physiatrist at Northwell Health. Her primary medical specialty is physical medicine, rehabilitation, and sports medicine with a concentration in treating female athletes. Dr. West, thank you for joining our discussion today. Thanks for having me. And we're also really thrilled to have Dr. Jen Welter with us. Dr. Welter has her PhD in sports psychology and is the first ever female coach in the NFL having coached for the Arizona Cardinals. She is also a highly decorated former professional football player herself. Dr. Walter, we are so happy to have you. Thank you. Hey, it's great to join you, and thanks for having this important conversation. Yeah, it is an important conversation. Um, I say we dive into it uh, by talking about something that really no one has gone unaffected by this year, which would be COVID-19. Uh, Dr. West, I want to start with you. You work in the medical field. I wonder how COVID-19 has affected the way you do your job. Well, to start off with, I mean, because of the pandemic, uh, we, uh, my outpatient office where I treat athletes uh, essentially came to a halt because uh, we weren't allowed to be seeing patients in the office. So I actually was reassigned to work in an emergency room and, and handle essentially people coming in with acute COVID symptoms. So um, I had to take on a new role and think about some parts of medicine I hadn't thought, of, thought about since residency, but um, I was in the emergency room seeing firsthand how uh, people were affected by this. So um, it's, it definitely changed that part of my practice at when COVID hit its peak. And certainly here in New York and Northwell Health, sort of had the, the, the took the brunt of that, uh, that the pandemic with all, how many patients they had uh, being seen for this. Um, other than that, as far as, uh, you know, post uh, the acute part of the pandemic, um, I saw a lot of people who were exercising at home for the first time or hadn't exercised at home in a long time. So they were getting injuries, uh, you know, falling off of couches and uh, setting up pull-up bars on their door frames that fell apart and things like that, which were sort of new injuries. Um, I also saw people who had to stop their physical therapy because they couldn't go into the uh, physical therapy offices. So they were coming to my clinic, uh, sort of deconditioned, um, trying to do things at home when weren't able to really make those connections happen. Um, I also saw people picking up new sports activities, uh, things like rollerblading, which uh, I haven't seen many rollerblading injuries in my career, uh, but people found their rollerblades in their in the garage and decided to give them a spin again for the first time in 20 years and you know we're falling and things like that so um as far as the the pandemic's concerned it, it sort of changed the kind of injuries and the way people were getting injured um now i'm starting to see more people getting back into sport after you know some of them have been off for almost a year um uh, and you know experiencing um you know things like tendonitis and you know new injuries from just not having been engaged in those activities regularly for a period of time so um it's always changing well, you, yeah, you just mentioned uh, people who had a break from sport getting back into it. Let's keep that in mind because I want to come right back to that. Before we do, uh, Dr. Welter, you did something really interesting uh, during this pandemic. You wrote a book series uh, to help children cope with COVID-19. Can you kind of explain the motivation behind you doing that? Yeah, you know, it, it was such a tough time. And I was listening to a lot of my friends, as I say, doing serious adulting. Right. They were like globally sourcing PPE and doing all these things. And I'm like, yeah, I don't I don't know how to do that. And yet um, one of my areas of focus when I was getting my master's was really how we could break um, complex topics down to kids. And there was not a lot of that in sports psychology. So I really got into play and drawing therapy and starting to hear first that kids were physically bouncing off walls then that they were experiencing kind of emotional separation, then that there was a lot of confusion about, you know, why am I now you know, washing my hands 87 times and, you know, wearing a mask, which typically would have been a villain. Um, I just knew that storytelling could be such a comfort to help the kids and equip the parents with tools that weren't already out there. And so a good friend of mine, Brooke Foley, and I decided to launch Critter Fitter, which is 
using critters to get kids fitter through motion and emotion and really um, tell some of those stories in an approachable way to help kids be a proactive, positive part of the solution. Well, that is amazing because yes, we as adults are all dealing with new things. I really cannot imagine dealing with a pandemic when you are a kid. And one aspect of that is a lot of children had their sports seasons canceled, right? Um, they learn so much from sports. It gives kids structure and, and uh, purpose after school, um, very hard on children. But this, you know, we also saw this across professional sports, right? Uh, seasons, pause, uh, tournaments canceled. I wonder, Dr. Welder, if you could talk about the, uh, the psychology behind this. If a professional athlete who's been training for the Olympics, not just the last four years, right, their entire life, and then they're told it's getting shifted, it's moving. So now their endpoint in training has changed. What does that do to this, like, the psychology of an Olympic caliber athlete? Yeah, you know, it's really important to think about so everybody had things stop and shift in this world, right? And um, for some, um, it it's not as structured in terms of time, right? Time can be a little bit more relative. Yes, it's disruptive for everybody, but when you're working towards a goal that is very timed out in terms of periodization, in terms of maximum performance, in terms of you know, rest recovery and all of that that we have to put into cycles for peak performance, you're taking what is inconvenient for everybody and putting it to the highest level because it's not just that one period of time that's disrupted, it's a whole training cycle. And put on top of that, not being able to train in the same way, there's a lot of comparison. There's also global comparisons on, you know, how we handled the situation in terms of timing and restrictions in the U.S. versus, you know, Canada versus, you know, certain parts of the country that are relatively back to, you know, real life now. And those athletes are then in a comparison mode as well. You also took away um, big parts of their identity, and that's one of the most important parts, right? Their social circle, their social capital, um, the way they make money, and also how they invest so much of their time. And depending on um, kind of the pillars that their identity is built on, that can be very, very tough in terms of um, the makings of an identity crisis if they're in a place close to identity foreclosure, which means their their whole identity is wrapped up in their role as an athlete. Um, so a really tough time. And for all of us, it's a time when, you know, that was whether sports were our decompressed place, right? They're a place where we get a lot of our endorphins, whether we're playing and competing or watching, we get that. And um, so the lack of movement has been very traumatic and the social implications as well. So um, a, lot of, a lot of really tough times in the athletic circle um, and even the expectations of knowing that your, fr your fans feel disappointed. Right, that's a weight that a lot of people don't think about when when fans are complaining about sports not taking place. Athletes take that very much to heart because not only is it what they want to do, but it's also what they really want to do for other people. Such a good point about the athletes around the world kind of being on the same timetable, but different restrictions, and that affects their training. That's a, an amazing point, uh, Dr. West. Staying on kind of lined with the Olympics uh, as an example. Can you talk about maybe the kind of physical buildup that an athlete has to go through in a training cycle for an Olympics and then what happens to their body when they very suddenly find out, well, actually your Olympic start date is being pushed a year? I mean, yeah, so uh, each sport has their specific uh, training regimen as, as they build up to a big event. And something like the Olympics certainly um, has very – different sports have very specific um, cycles in order to maximize the performance at uh, this event. Um, what we've seen, uh, as, we, as we saw the sort of the, 
date be delayed and then stopped and restarted at a later date is now how do we adjust uh, those cycles so that they are appropriate now for the extended date. Um, that being said, uh, something that's been difficult in, in this is access to training facilities, access to uh, coaches, access to um, you know different ways of, of training so that they can maintain their schedule. So not only do they have to extend extend the schedule, but they also had to adjust it to what was available to them. And that has varied greatly between sports, certainly with uh, disparities between men and, and women um, and their access to uh, training environments during this, uh, different sports, different levels of competition all have very different um, access to different things. So um, we've seen that it's not it hasn't been as easy even if the training schedule was adjusted um maintaining that with the, these changing dates has been very, is very very difficult especially for fem female athletes um, we're thinking about our, our paralympic athletes um you know people who don't necessarily have a lot of like, extra money and and private facilities well how do you maintain that especially if you live in an apartment in a small city and and don't have a lot of room to even exercise how do you maintain an Olympic level training schedule? So, um, you know, we're finding now that people are returning to sport. Everyone's kind of coming back to a different place, and and now it's, now we're trying to catch everybody up so everyone's on the same at the same starting line so that they can optimize the performance for for things like the Olympics. Well, and so, Dr. West, I'm wondering if you could help me out with this. So, your career deals with the body. But when you're working with an athlete, whether you know it's an Olympian or not, a professional athlete though, what role does mental health play in preparation, physical preparation for an event or physical recovery, which I know you deal with a lot? Well, your mental health is essentially another vital sign. You know, it's not just your heart rate and your blood pressure, or your respiratory rate. It's how are you feeling? How are you sleeping? How are you eating? These are all things that are very important, uh, especially in sports, because sports has its own, uh, you know, area of specialty of specialized psychology with it, as Dr. Walter knows. So um, it's something that is very important uh, to be discussing, to be thinking about. Um, as Dr. Walter pointed out, athletes see themselves that's their identity. That's their, um, their, the main thing that they identify when interacting with the world. So to have that affected in any way, whether it's through an injury or something like a pandemic is, can be devastating. Um, and I see that quite often with injuries, uh, often the recovery is affected by the person's, uh, mental state about their injury. So if, if they're feeling pessimistic, if they're scared to return because they're scared of getting injured again, these can all affect their performance, even if physically their bodies are, are doing well. Um, so that's something that's definitely plays a huge role. Also the, the social community aspect of sport is there's a whole separate uh, social community that exists for an athlete when they're engaging in their sport. And when that's taken away, um, again, by pandemic, by injury, by whatever it is, it's devastating because this is how people interact on a day-to-day -day basis. This is what keeps them motivated. This is what keeps them inspired. Um, this is what keeps them accountable. So if that's taken away, uh, it can be very difficult for that person to perform ideally, even if physically they're doing well. And you both have already explained this, um, but I'm hoping we can expand. So, Dr. Welter, if I get hurt, it's not great. It's inconvenient. Um, I can still do my job. What kind of toll does it take mentally on an athlete who gets injured but relies on their body for their career? What? Because I'm not sure I can even imagine it. I've not been through it. So can you explain what that's like? Yeah, the, um, the actually the psychological impact of a career ending or threatening injury on an athlete is likened to the death of a close family member. That's how hard it hits. And um, one of the things that also makes it really tough, and you touched on this, is that you know it's hard for you to imagine what that feels like and how deeply it affects you in so many areas. So let's just say that it was, you know, um, somebody that was really close to you, whether it was a family member or, you know, a loved one who went through this 
and you're that person that they've always felt really close to and like they can they can talk to and actually let that guard down, right? Because as athletes, we're taught never to admit fear, never to admit weakness. So to, you know, cross that line into I don't feel okay or I'm scared or I don't know who I am right now without this is really tough. And then you go and you say that to somebody who's supposed to get you, somebody who's supposed to be one of your people in this world. And you say, oh, come on, it's just a knee. Or you got this, just shake it off. There's so many things you're good at. Then not only what happens is their pain and their trauma has been minimized, but also there's a chasm created between them and the people who are supposed to know them the best, right? And I say, when we're dealing with areas of life, um, especially when it comes to like, and the reason why there's a, you know, there is a psychology of sport or a sports psych, you know, psychology mindset is we're looking at the world through a different lens, right? So I want you to picture one of those old school um, fun and house things with all the different mirrors, right? That you look at and some make your head like this big and others make you like this big. That's kind of the psychology of what we're talking about at these extremes. Athletes can do insane things, right? I played football against men. A lot of people are like, oh my gosh, that's so frightening. And I'm like, oh, it's, it's football, right? Is it scary? Yes. But to me, it's my area of expertise. So it's, it's not the same reaction. But so that to me is relatively normal. To somebody else, it's larger than life and frightening. And yet to athletes, because of their reliance and because of how much of their life interconnects through their physical ability, that's why the trauma of an injury is so magnified for them, as opposed to someone else who, like you said, it's inconvenient, but I can do my job, right? And so a lot of the times, the places and the spaces that we have misunderstandings maybe between athletes and those who love and care about them is that miss in communication of the gravity of situations and the importance of their life and how it interconnects to other things. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And Dr. West, I'm wondering if that's what you found in your practice when you treat professional athletes. And I wonder how you go about uh, the mental aspect of it when they come to you for the physical. Yeah, speaking to that, I mean, exactly. So when you are dealing with an athlete who's had an injury like this, minimizing it does not help. <laughs> and uh, ignoring the the psychosocial, the mental health issues associated with, with it does not help. So it's understanding uh, when, you know, when I'm dealing with an, an athlete, even if it's a recreational athlete who has a, a sport that they love and do not want to be away from, um, I have to, to really dissect that relationship that they have with the sport and then give them some encouragement about the return to sport and also make it clear to them that I, I understand how important it is to them and that we're all trying to work to get that person back to it which, you know, not necessarily, not necessarily not all physicians have that same understanding, especially if you, you know, if you're dealing with a physician who doesn't deal with a lot of athletes, um, they might not get it. They understand why, what do you mean? So, so just don't run for a period of time or just don't do this for a period of time. And that, to tell an athlete that, it can be devastating. So I always try to find, instead of telling people what they can't do, trying to find the things they can do and the things that they can modify and finding ways for them to participate in the sport in some way or some version of that sport in some way so that they're able to at least feel like they're still part of a team, still part of the process, even if it's just going and sitting on the sideline, um, being involved in practices, um, doing some modified workout while the team is practicing, something like that so that they still hold on to that identity that we've all spoken about as being so important to these athletes. Um, so that's, that's a really big part of it. Also connecting them with a mental health provider is important. It, it cannot not be ignored, especially something like an ACL injury, for example. Um, you know, we take care of the, the surgical part, the, the physical therapy part, but there's a huge mental part in this, not just from sitting out from the injury, but also coming back from the injury and the fear associated with that. And sometimes physical therapists will come back to me and say, this person is just not, 
they're not where they should be right now. Why is that? And a lot of times it's because there's a mental part of that that needs to be sorted out. There's a fear, there's a anxiety. So um, being able to recognize that there, this is a part of the, the physical injury and then connecting that athlete with people that can help them stay involved and help them deal with the psychological ramifications of the injury is is very important and needs to be part it's a multidisciplinary approach to dealing with these injuries it's not just a physical one that and what i would add is you know you mentioned the rehab part rehab for an athlete is very different than rehab for general population and the psychological complications are too a lot of the times you'll find that an athlete almost has to be kept um, kept under guidelines as opposed to push forward, right? Rehab for general population, um, getting them to go uh, can be tough at times, right? If being physical and getting that fully back is not a huge part of their identity. Oh, I don't want to go to rehab. I'm going to, I'm going to skip out. And so you're trying to connect them to a community and get them to cross that bridge of actually doing the work that they need to do. Whereas athletes psychologically we're used to doing everything bigger, faster, stronger, um, and that faster is always better. So in a rehab situation, a lot of the times you're having to, um, you know, make sure that they're not pushing too far too fast. And because they're trying to almost overcompensate for what they learned in bit that they weren't invincible, right? A lot of doing these giant feats is that, you know, there's something physically special about me, which then translates into, I should physically be able to do this faster and better um, too. And so it's really un important to understand that the response to that trauma is very different in even how they'll approach rehab. Some will completely go the other way where they just don't want to do it. Um, they almost fall into that, that victim of, you know, if I don't, if I don't try that hard, I won't get hurt that hard again or that badly again. Um, because there's this heartbreak of losing an opportunity, but then for others, it's like, I have to overcompensate. And so it's really important to dial in that interpersonal relationship that understands where those insecurities are, how they're approaching that situation and what their normal psychology of, um, going into challenges is because you'll see it manifest in how they, um, how they approach those things as well. I'm sure Doc knows, you know, you'll have some that are like, oh, I'm good. Like there's nothing like this never happened almost just in that. And then there's others that, you know, it's literally like you took Superman and dunked him in a sea of kryptonite, right? And, and it is not one size fits all. And it is a very um, important process and very important that um, those connections to their sports are made. One of the um, the hard things that I've seen from teams is that somebody gets injured and then they get separated. Um, and that really is like adding insult to the injury because now are they not only um, physically different at that time, but they are also physically and emotionally separated, which makes it harder for them to still feel a part of that team and that organization. I mean, you two have done such a good job at explaining how layered an injury really is for an athlete. And Dr. Welter, you just mentioned the team makes me think of um, an individual athlete, say a tennis player whose performance, they have a whole team behind them that isn't on the court with them, right? But they have coaches, they have PR and their, their bodies uh, kind of help pay for for everyone behind them. It's a, it's a lot of pressure, but I wonder in terms of mental health, uh, what are some of the biggest challenges uh, aside from injuries that as, uh, that athletes face nowadays that maybe they didn't face 15 or 20 years ago? Dr. Walter, let's start with you. Um, well, you mentioned the tennis player and how, how their bodies really are um, a product and they're an asset to that entire team right? 
that's pressure in in a number of ways, right? You see it manifest in um, image consciousness, in body and muscle dysmorphia, in a lot of eating disorders, depending on the industry, particularly if there are weight limits um, and some of that, both for males and females. Um, so there's definitely a body consciousness, right? Which sometimes gets to the extremes of performance, whether it's, um, you know, overworking out, over pushing yourself, not enough nutrients. Um, there is a meticulous care that gets to it. And it's also um, very much that they are under a microscope in terms of the pressure, both in terms of performance pressure, but also presentation of self pressure, right? Particularly in, you know, fandom can be very tough, very cruel. Um, I always say, be great, don't read the comments, right? Like, because no matter how good you are on or off the court, um, there's always going to be those people that are that are tough about it. Um, but it is particularly hard, especially in a solo sport, because the outcome is really on your shoulders, right? In a team sport, you your identity is, yes, it's yours, but it's also yours as a part of this big unit. Whereas in a solo sport, the outcome is yours, right? And the mistakes are yours and you do have all of these people with you. So there is um, very much a magnifying glass on all the things that you do, um, what you say, how you respond and how you look. And I, I would say that's, that's one of the most um, kind of the toughest elements of what we see today because of social media and access to two-way communication as opposed to you're just playing a match and you're on TV and maybe there was a commentator or a newspaper article. Um, now it's 24 seven um, and a pressure to be on to all people at all times. There's lots of, um, there's lots of vested, um, Kind of people with a vested interest, right? People who are pulling from you, whether it's the social team, the trainers and all of that, or the fans as well. And Dr. West, from the physical aspect, is there more pressure nowadays to do greater things physically? Because you kind of always hear about, well, training has gotten better, technology has gotten better, so people sh should be faster, stronger. What does that do for athletes physically? Is that true? Is that what we're seeing? I mean, yeah. So nowadays with social media, I mean, you can have a high school kid post a video of him doing something and it's seen by a million people in a matter of hours. You know, this is a new kind of, it's a new kind of pressure that athletes are under because there's always someone better than you and you can see them. <laughs> and you, and, they're, they're, and there's people who will tell you about that at all times, uh, especially with, with female athletes there, we're kind of in a place right now where we're, we're seeing a shift. Uh, we're not just focusing on what the female body looks like, but what it can do and do physically. And, and that, that's been sort of changing over the past few years. I, I've, see, I've seen that the emphasis is not just being on like small and skinny and the, a female athlete is not, you know, just a dancer or an ice skater. It's, it's a football player. It's uh, someone who's, you know, it's someone who's playing uh, you know, basketball at a high level. I mean, these are requiring a, a, a physical presence that that was not necessarily associated with female athletes 20 years ago. So um, seeing that change is, is encouraging, but at the same time, there are people who kind of stand on all, all, on all different parts of that spectrum as far as what they see a female athlete as being and what female athletes are, are and are becoming. Um, so the, there's been there's been an increase in, in training women differently, um, sort of bringing them up to the same standards that the men have been held to, uh, focusing on the, the fitness piece of it. Um, is, you know, it's, uh, right now we've seen uh, the, this social media post that's gone viral with showing the different weight rooms of the NCAA men's tournament versus the women's tournament. And the men have a gigantic weight room, you know, for essentially for Olympians and the women have a rack of dumbbells in the corner. Um, so, you know, this idea that, you know, not everyone is on the same page as how women physically can perform better and the things that they should and should not be able to do. And I, I, we still have progress to make in, in that respect, but I, I have seen encouraging 
things happening. So I'm, I'm excited for that going forward. Well, you specialize in, in treating female athletes. What does that entail? I, I just wonder how your medical treatment uh, and training of female athletes differs from that of a male athlete. Well, so female athletes in, in general, females ha are not just you know smaller version of versions of men, right? So females have a unique hormonal aspect to uh, you know certainly talking about menstruation and how that that affects. Uh, injury rates and muscle mass and uh, body composition and things like that. Uh, biomechanically, we are built differently um, and our joints move differently. And that's something that has to be taken into consideration as well. So when treating a female athlete, there's there are many layers to dissecting why injuries may or may not have happened. And then there's the whole mental health aspect of it, the social pressures, um, things like that, that are not always brought to the forefront when treating an injury. So things like um, energy intake and, you know, looking for disordered eating, um, how that affects menstruation and bone health uh, is important in dissecting. If you're, if I see someone, for example, with a stress fracture, that's a very layered conversation. I have to talk about what they're eating. I have to talk about their, how much they're training. I have to talk about what kind of pressures they're under. And I have to look at how their joints are moving and I have to treat the fracture and dissect those other pieces. Because if I'm just looking at the fracture and I just put them in a cast and tell them to come back in four weeks, maybe the fracture will heal, but they'll be back again with another one. So uh, having to dissect all those layers is, is important in, in treating uh, a female athlete, com athlete completely. Dr. Walter, you're nodding your head. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, she's spot on, right? Uh, you know, women and men, um, we have many similarities, but we also have many unique facets that really taking into account, um, you can't separate them, right? Nor should you. Maybe maybe years ago, they just tried to fit the, fit the women into their own box or a, or a smaller version of a men's box, but how all of those things fit into also your vision of self, right? There's still, um, very much um, a socialization challenge and and narrative um, narratives that are associated with be with being female athletes, right? You do um, look at where you are in your sport relative to men, right? You do see that their weight room is, you know, a palace, and yours are dumbbells. That what am I supposed to do? Warm up with this? Right. Like, you know, it, it those situations, though, you want to say I'm the best in the world and this is the best on the best. Like those resource disparities are very real and you can't not see them or or feel them. And that does translate into, um, you know, what you can dedicate to the sport. And um, also there are pressures on women, you know. Um, in terms of competition and children, um, how does that figure out? Uh, how does that figure into um, the life cycle of your career, right? And what does taking that time mean? Um, you know, we saw the big case with Nike and what um, the implications were of having pregnancy um, and on your contract, right? Those are all such important things that we have to look at. And we also have to look at that, you know, 4% of the media coverage, sports media coverage goes to women in sports. And what does that, what role does that then play on the next generation of the athletes who see very clearly in, um, in the places where I say sports suffer from sins of omission, right? You don't have to tell a girl that her competition is important. It's reinforced, isn't as important. It's reinforced every place she is not. Every place she can't see someone who looks like her. And those things then impact whether or not girls stay in sports and their confidence um, or their connection to other female mentors. So when we look at female athletes, um, there are not only the physiological differences, but the psychological pressures as well. Yeah, and that interaction, this idea that you know, we are equal but different and often 
the people perceive it one of those things is off you know it, so this I, the, we want the same things but we have to approach them a little bit differently and th that sometimes can be difficult for the powers that be to comprehend right Dr. West, that's, I was just going to follow up with that. What what should the narrative be there? Because, yes, you're right. Sometimes it seems like um, people try to pin these two narratives against each other, like they can't work in tandem. So how do we control that narrative? What is the narrative? Well, part of this, it's this idea of equal but different, um, you know, we as as female athletes, we want to achieve the same things. Our bodies are capable of achieving those things. And and pound for pound, when you look at the the scientific data, um, a, women and men actually have equal performance relative to their body composition. The, you know, the the best female athlete and the best male athlete in the same sport can perform equally as well, given that their body compositions are slightly different. Um, and I, I think because the absolute number might not be the same, the time or the weight or whatever it is might not be the same, then the, uh, the, the female is automatically sort of downgraded. But when you look at the body composition and the hormonal milieu that this the body exists in, it sometimes it actually outperforms the men in certain sports. So, you know, this idea of, of you know, building up those accomplishments, expecting expecting great things from female athletes and, and and giving them the resources to achieve those things. I think we're still behind in that. So it, it's a bit, it's harder for women to achieve those things as athletes. I mean, I, I saw an article in a, in a newspaper a few years ago and it said like something about like why women can't do pull-ups. And that's crazy to me because I know many women who do many pull-ups and if you put that expectation on, on a woman that she can't do them or that she shouldn't be able to because her body just won't let her, um, then that's what you will achieve. And it, it's it's crazy. So, um, you know, re restructuring that narrative to, uh, to especially to young women show and having, you know, uh, role models to show them that it's possible. And and part of that is, is getting the, the, the media to, to pay attention to it and, and lift, lift up women's voices. I mean, I just saw a, a, a a video on YouTube of high school girls dunking basketballs. I was like, I was like, this is amazing. But you know, like this should be, this should be on TV. Like we should be seeing this. So, um, you know, things like that. So boosting each other up, giving, you know, having platforms like this where we can talk about it and get it in people's faces, I think is, is the first step. Dr. Walter, I see you agreeing with Dr. West. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, if I think a lot of it comes from perception um, and and where we start the narrative, right? Um, if you look at, for example, basketball, okay? Because we always get, oh, well, the women don't dunk this, that, and the other, okay? But that means that you've you've set the value proposition that great basketball equals dunking a basketball. Now, if you set the value proposition with what I've heard from basketball experts, which is, you know, the women are better with passing the strategy of the game, some of those elements. If you if you started there and said that this was what the top level of basketball looked like, then you watched the NBA, you might be like, why are they traveling up all the time? Or why why do they keep going to the hoop when you could have worked your teammates better? Right. It it really depends like where we put emphasis on what's important and why is the goal for a woman to be on par with a man. Right. Why is it not like this is the best of the best and she deserves the best of the best training as her body and her unique chemistry dictates. Right. So meaning, hey, we both deserve, you know, a great nutrition program, right? We, we, we deserve to know what our body needs and we're going to get it right as an athlete. Okay. That means we have to know your body and then we're going to come up with the solution. That means you have to start with the individual and then allocate the resources instead of we just need to replicate the resources off what somebody else gets. That means we're always off because we're going off someone else's standard that set rather than looking at the situation and seeing how it can be optimized for each individual and having that be the goal as opposed to something that is, you know, that is fundamentally grounded in comparison. Well, you know, believe it or not, our time is almost up and I have such an important concept to present. Um, Dr. Welter, 
we've already mentioned social media a lot on here. Um, I, I am of the opinion that sometimes the um, meanest, but voices can be the loudest, even if they're the fewest. Um, and I think sometimes uh, we, we see that in the case of women getting involved on the sidelines of uh, male sports, um, like football. But I wonder, um, those opinions of the few on social media, are is that the treatment you receive when you work with male athletes and you're coaching them? Uh, no. Um, I, I have found the athletes that I've worked with, the guys to be just outstanding, right? Guys want to be better. If you can make them better, they'll listen. I've also seen them be protectors um, in terms of my treatment, whether it was when I played with the guys or when I coached them. Um, they actually can be the very best of the best. And that's what I've witnessed. You know, it's like you see the best of the relationships of how it can be with respect between men and women. Um, I, I've never felt that way from the guys that I coached, um, though I have definitely been a target of that on, you know, from the exterior. And I think that's the difference between being an insider and an outsider. An outsider always wants to find a difference or a way to make themselves feel justified by breaking somebody else down. Whereas those who are committed to the best of the best really want those around who bring them out, that out in them as um, players, but also as people, you know, if you read the comments and I, you know, I went back and did it at one point because I'd had them referenced so many times. Um, if you read the comments of what the Cardinals players said, for example, after I was there, there was a lot of, uh, you know, there was a through line of she not only made us better as players, but as people. And ultimately that's the goal. And if, if somebody's missing that on social media, they're missing the point or they're missing a whole lot of the points. So um, it's a it's a definite world. And I I see you uh, shaking your head as well, Doc. I mean, I know that they thought of me as like their secret weapon at times um, and were very protective. I yeah. I know one situation I was in, um, not with the Cardinals, but in another situation, um, there was a coach who, you know, just the dynamic wasn't good. He didn't respect when I was coaching players and some of that. And the guys would literally be like, oh, I'm sorry, Coach Jen just told me that. Or she was talking or, you know, and they would make sure that I was not only heard, but I was not left to fend for myself in those situations. Um, and I think that that's really powerful as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm same thing. I'm so I'm, I work in an orthopedics department, and it's mostly men. Um, and I work with teams, and often I'm the only female physician involved with the teams, even with women's teams. Um, and it's it's similar thing. I, I think sometimes even with patients, I I sometimes have to work a little harder to get that level of respect. Or sometimes uh, men sort of want you know patients, for example, like sort of. They see you and they're like, we're well, not sure if she knows what she's talking about. And then you have to sort of win them over a little bit. Um, so sometimes there's a little bit of that of sort of, um, you know, you have to work a little bit harder to get that respect. But overall, you know, people have been very supportive. And, and then once you earn that trust and that respect, then, you know, it's it's like anybody else. Um, I, you know, it's, as females are always looking, you know, for a, a seat at the table in in some of these areas, and and sometimes we just have to make our own table and 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 start our own thing. So, um, you know, whether it's working within a department, um, you know, and now we're trying to establish a, a women's sports program, so we'll create our own our own thing. So, um, you know, there's 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 ways to do it, but sometimes it takes a little bit more effort up front. Well, it, um, in terms of your respective. Uh, careers. Are we headed in the right direction? Uh, Dr. West, we'll start with you. Are we headed in the right direction you, uh, in orthopedics, uh, reaching equity for, for both genders? I think so. And especially recently, there's been an effort to kind of examine the, the field and, and look look inward to see, you know, how can we do better? How can we engage more younger uh, physicians who are, you know, students who are interested uh, in the field to attract them to 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 come to the field? And, and, and by having more women involved, then uh, that can sort of reflect the, the, the patient care that we give, you know, being able to better uh, uh, 
treat women and you know to treat uh, uh, female athletes, um, if we have more providers, you know, as as Dr. Welder was saying before, you know, if if uh, an athlete can and look and see someone like them uh, doing something that um, you know can uh, uh, you know you know have someone look like them in, in the field that they want to go into, then. Uh, that can just help inspire and similarly with athletes if if we have more women involved in orthopedics it will it will result in better care for female athletes so i i think we are going in the right direction uh we are certainly um actively trying to improve things and 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 that's the first step is, is recognizing that there's some issues and then working to try to change it and dr welter how about you uh and, and coaching, for example, no matter how you identify what your gender is, is there is there more space for that diversity on the sideline right now? Are we going in the right direction? You know, I would say patience is a virtue, and clearly I'm not that virtuous because, you know, I'd love to see it all right now and to say we have all of the answers and none of the questions and that we are, we're close. Um, it, Coaching is at an interesting point. We are seeing more um, more gender diversity in men's professional sports, um, but we've also seen um, at the collegiate level some of the jobs that in women's sports were traditionally um, mostly coached by women um, as the dollar values associated with those contracts have gone up. It's attracted a lot more um, male coaches. So now you have predominantly men coaching the men and then more men coaching in women's as well. So you are seeing some of the crossover in terms of, you know, women coaching men, but you've seen um, not as much growth in terms of women coaching overall. Um, so I think we need to make sure um, that we're being intentional in, um, in really opening pipelines at all levels to women in sports um, and making that an attractive uh, career path. Um, I think a lot of the times we focus on, and even if you picture in your mind, right, for most of you out there, if I were to ask you to picture a coach, what would you picture, right? And, and for us to truly create societal change, we have to, um, we have to change some of those narratives right? There are very few, for example, like if we look at um, extended narratives, can you name a movie with female coaches? You can name a ton of sports movies with a ton of guys up front, but very few with women in those roles. So we're still, um, we're still behind in terms of how we set up what a coach looks like and where that fits, I think, in our culture as, as a whole. Yes, we have made some progress, but um, we need to be far more progressive in our thinking and in our communication around those things. Well, Dr. West, Dr. Welter, unfortunately, I cannot believe we've reached our time. I could talk to you two forever, um, but I know you are very busy and have a lot to do. You have given us so much to, to think about. Thank you for this thoughtful conversation. Uh, we really appreciate it and hope you have uh, a great day. Great. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Yeah, thank you.